Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Calgary's sixth annual Legacy Society event. I'm Dr. Lale Behjad and I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Software Engineering within the Schulich School of Engineering here at the University of Calgary. I'm also the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, commonly called NSERC, Chair for Women in Science and Engineering in the Perry region. It is wonderful to be here today among such an exceptional group of people, including our Legacy Society members and special guests. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. While we miss being able to meet in person for dinner, it's a still a pleasure to get together virtually. It is lovely chatting with you at the Mix and Mingle, and I look forward to talking to more of you during our virtual table discussions. Before we begin the program, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising of Siksika, Pikani, and Nkanai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nations and the Stony Nakoda, including Chiniki, Bearspa, and Westland First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Wherever you happen to be joining us from today, I'm confident that each of us are residing on the unceded territory of at least one Indigenous First Nation. I would like to do an overall acknowledgement to these various nations and to express our thanks for being able to call these lands our respective homes. For those of you who are new to this event, the University of Calgary Legacy Society celebrates individuals who have included University of Calgary in their state plans. These contributions are earmarks to support student awards, bursaries, innovation teaching and learning initiatives, and life-changing research. And they will help secure the future of this institution. For the donor, a legacy gift is an opportunity to ensure your passion and value will continue to live on and inspire future generations to come. It's an opportunity to transform the world and establish how you would like to be remembered. It's one of the ultimate forms of generosity and University of Calgary is incredibly grateful to be part of your legacy. And that's why we come together this afternoon to celebrate the impact of giving, specifically legacy giving, and share some of the work that's made possible by your philanthropic community. Today, we are given the unique chance to dive into how you Calgary has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and explore some of the ex exciting innovations that arose during these unprecedented times. But before we get into these discussions, we will hear from you Calgary leadership and share a short video about one of our legacy donors and the impact of this, his gift. At this time, I would like to invite Andrea Morris, our interim vice president of advancement to share more about how your support has made a difference at the University of Calgary and in the community. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction and welcome to the University of Calgary Legacy Society celebration. It's a great group of people, current and former faculty, staff, academic and administrative leaders, current and past volunteers from many groups, including the Alumni Association, the Board of Governors, the Senate, business owners, industry partners, startup founders, members of our community who year after year, engage with our students and faculty to offer time and resources to improve our university and in turn, our society. Thank you for attending today. It really does feel like a recommitment to the promise of a great research university. It's inspiring. I have had the good fortune of serving as interim vice president of advancement uh, since March of this year. But I've been hanging around here a while. I started here in uh, 2015 and I came to lead the Energize campaign, the campaign for Eyes High. I came here then because it was clear to me that something magical was happening here at the University of Calgary. I wanted to come and experience it myself. 
I've now had the opportunity to see it up close and to learn about the people and investments that have shaped this university. It's a place where you, our volunteers, our alumni, many of you who are not our alumni, employees and community partners roll up their sleeves to get involved. In our 55 year history and through ups and downs in our economy, that spirit and commitment has never wavered. And it certainly hasn't wavered in this past year. Since the pandemic began, we closed the very successful Energize campaign. And our promotional materials say there's 1.4 billion reasons to celebrate. But within that number are thousands of stories of individuals like you who chose the University of Calgary as the place to achieve their philanthropic goals. And today is the day we get to celebrate you and that commitment. We get to tell you just a few stories of how philanthropy has and will transform our research and our student experience. And there's no doubt after the year that's been, we could give you countless examples. This year, there are stories of new awards to support students struggling with financial need or students who have felt marginalized, urgent programs in mental health or specialized lab space or equipment to fight the pandemic. The list really does go on. Despite the pandemic and the challenges we faced, your university was resilient, relentless and ambitious. In a word, entrepreneurial. Using creativity and innovation, our students engaged with each other and with their communities. Research continued and is making an impact. And our experts worked with organizations in Alberta, across Canada and around the world to lend our expertise to solve health, economic and societal challenges. I know President McCauley will want to share a few highlights and the presentations from our Schulich School of Engineering leaders will make you proud. But for my part, what I wanted to say is that the reason that the University of Calgary is an extraordinary place is because of you. I sincerely believe that our margin of excellence as a young university is the investments of time and treasure from our community. And while we haven't gotten to see you in person much over this past year, please know that your gifts and your commitments to the future through the Energize campaign and the Legacy Society have guided us resourced us and inspired us. And finally, I want to ask you to stick around with us. With the energy of the students back on campus here, labs and classes filled up with brilliant scholars and our doors open for community connections, we're equipped to lead and to help our students lead in the recovery challenges that lie ahead. I can't wait to see where your support takes us in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, Andrea. The impact of philanthropy at the University of Calgary can certainly be seen far and wide. Now I would like to introduce the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Calgary, Dr. Ed McCauley. Thanks, Lolly. Really appreciate it. And hello, everyone. As Andrea mentioned earlier, philanthropy plays a pivotal role in the work we do. We are able to be very bold and forward looking as a university because we have the support of an incredible network within the Legacy Society. So I want to start by sharing our gratitude and really emphasizing how much of a privilege it is for us to count your support. Working in partnership with leaders like you means that the University of Calgary continues to be a major driver of economic resilience and societal progress. We create an annual economic impact of $16.5 billion and support more than 22,000 jobs through direct and indirect employment. And scholars within our innovation ecosystem are translating great ideas into viable commercial ventures. They're leading everything from tech startups to medical breakthroughs to social enterprises and more. And most importantly, we're empowering the people behind these new jobs and ventures with meaningful skills development. And this includes offerings in work integrated learning, stackable credentials, experiential learning, and other options. I can talk at a high level about the impact that you've helped us achieve together. But what I think really illustrates the importance of these efforts is seeing how we're able to respond in a time of crisis. The current pandemic 
is one major case in point. And I can't wait for you to hear from our panel tonight on some of the truly extraordinary work taking place. Across our entire university, in every faculty, we have experts contributing countermeasures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. These leaders have been working closely with the city of Calgary to support our local response. And they played a prominent role on the national and international stage as well. I'll share a few highlights to give you a sense of the scope of these contributions. Thanks to the support of our community, University of Calgary researchers are monitoring hospital wastewater to identify local outbreaks. They designed a low cost ventilator that is so groundbreaking, it recently won an international award. And they've created a COVID-19 cough app that could help pre-screen possible cases. They've established an international coalition of experts to better understand how the virus affects children. And they're working alongside colleagues across the country to improve our response to the next pandemic, among many, many other examples. This is the type of leadership that you have helped us achieve. Your support has meant that we are responding to a situation that has been extremely challenging and isolating with the polar opposite. We've been able to respond with courage. We've been able to focus on collaboration and connection. And we've been able to shine a light on a positive path forward, shaped by the shared conviction that we can create a better future for our community. I hope you see just how much your dedication means to all of us. Thank you for believing in the University of Calgary and working with us to make extraordinary things possible. Thank you, Dr. McCauley. While this past year has brought many challenges, it is inspiring to look back at all that we have accomplished by working together. Finally, before we get into our discussion, I am pleased to share with you the story of one of our Legacy Society members. As a member of the very first class of engineers to graduate from the University of Calgary, Gordon Forbes is a part of UCalgary history and he has invested in its future by designating a legacy gift in support of the next generation of engineers. Here's a look at Gordon's story about his gift and its impact. We graduated in 1969, and we were the first graduating class for BSc degrees out of Calgary. So we were the first class at 50 years I liked engineering, I liked what I did. It was exciting. I can look around town and I can look at buildings. That was part of that, it was part of this. And in the future, I just see it getting better and better. From when I graduated, you always got the letters to donate and I gave what I could. Well, this year, I'm getting a little older, so we, we worked on our wills. And I kind of knew that there was this legacy to the university, and I went through, okay, now I'm going to put that money towards something that makes sense to me. When a philanthropist thinks about donating to support engineering students, they really think of, you know, robots and the technical side. At the same time, they've been in industry for a while and they probably know that one of the most important elements of a, a strong engineer is their leadership skills, their communication skills. It's not what it used to be. It's not just a focus on technical, a focus on math. We need to think of the social side of engineering. And a lot of what I do is helping students really understand and reflect on what it is to be an engineer. And specifically, I'm looking at some of the biases that exist within engineering classrooms and how we can create a more inclusive environment. The more diverse our population of engineering students are, the more diverse the innovations are. When they're investing in the next generation, they're, they're in a way acknowledging that engineering is different and they're willing to invest in that and to say, I went to school 50 years ago and I learned in this way and I want to invest in what the future is. The future, to me, looks good. 
Something new is happening all the time and it just makes you proud. The next generation, is, well, they are the future. I've been there and done that. So if I can contribute somehow with whatever gift I give, then I'll feel good. Thank you, Gordon. It's incredible to see our first class of engineers supporting the next generation of innovators and educators like Robin. I can't think of a more fitting legacy. Gifts like Gordon's, the commitment to a brighter tomorrow are truly inspiring. Much has changed since our first class of engineers some 52 years ago. Today, we know the importance of diversity and representation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, collectively referred to as a STEM. As the NSERC Chair for Women in Science and Engineering, I lead the WISE Planet program, where I work closely with Robin Paul and many others. We are in the middle of digital and biotechnology revolutions that give us a window of opportunity for improving our lives and including a broader range of voices. In order to foster innovations and thrive in a world that will experience mounting technological and environmental disruptions, we need a diverse and inclusive environment. Wise Planet examines why women and other underrepresented groups are the ones to, uh, who are asked to change to fit within the system, while repositioning them as the makers of the new systems will be much more reflective of the 21st century. This is just one of the many diversity programs at the University of Calgary. Within the Schulich School of Engineering alone, there is a cyber mentor program, which was started by President Emerita, Dr. Elizabeth Cannon, Go Eng Girl for Young Women and Explore a STEM Conference. True equality and equity of opportunity is achieved when systemic barriers are identified and removed. These programs are the University of Calgary taking the steps in the right direction? And today we are joined by three University of Calgary scholars, two of which are women who champion inclusion and diversity. These University of Calgary experts are here to discuss the innovative ways that University of Calgary is addressing the various issues that face our community members during the COVID-19 pandemic from medical innovations to teaching and learning, as well as how we can better prepare for the future crisis. I'll introduce you. The first is University of Cal alumna, Dr. Emily Marasco. She's an instructor and teaching chair in the Department of Electrical and Software Engineering. Her current research and teaching interests are in learning engineering, including the use of machine learning, gamification, blended learning, and augmented reality as tools for enhancing creativity within software and computer engineering. Dr. Morasco has been recognized as the 2018 Aztec Outstanding Leader of Tomorrow and received the 2016 Claudette McKay Lassonde Graduate Award for Women in Engineering. She was also recognized as a 20, in 2019 as one of the Avenue Magazine's top 40 under 40. Dr. Jocelyn Haley is a professor in the Geotechnical Engineering and the Department Head of Civil Engineering at the University of Calgary. As a passionate educator, she teaches a variety of university classes and has an ever-evolving group of research students from around the world. Her research explores the geomechanics of gas hydrates, gassy soils, and permafrost sediments to understand geohazards arising from the climate change and the energy production. Dr. Haley is a strong advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion in STEM and beyond, and enjoys challenging audiences to use diversity in all its form to inspire creativity and innovation. In 2017, APEGA awarded her with the Champion of Women in Engineering and Geoscience Award, and the Engineering Institute of Canada recognized her career contributions with a fellowship in the Institute. 
Dr. Michael Callas is an alumnus of the University of Calgary and a cross-disciplinary researcher and professor in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering with an adjunct appointment in the Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy in the Cummings School of Medicine. Dr. Callas runs bioengineering lab investigating the development of a scaled up expansion and differentiation bioprocesses for adult embryonic stem cells. He's also the director of Biomedical Engineering Calgary Initiative and the Center for Bioengineering Research and Education. Dr. Callas is also one of the Avenue Magazine's top 40 under 40. Welcome everyone. So I would like to first start by each one of you briefly explain your role before the pandemic hit and what type of innovation and creativity were you working on? And let's Jocelyn start with you. Great, thank you. Well, before the pandemic, um, I was doing lots of things in my various roles. So some of the things I was doing is with my research, I was trying to look at how climate change is thawing our Arctic permafrost and how that impacts the infrastructure that both underpins our communities as well as connects our communities. And so doing some neat things and some interesting field work in my research. But I think what I want to focus on today is really more about my job, which is as the department head of civil engineering. And before the pandemic, I was looking at what can we do um, in our research on sustainable infrastructure and how can we drive that forward? Focusing a lot on transportation and disruption in the transportation systems, water that we use, wastewater, and looking at modernizing our civil engineering curriculum, including how to put a design spine through our curriculum, how to build digital engineering throughout our curriculum, and I think one of the most interesting things is I just started a task force talking about sustainability engineering and how are we going to bring that into our civil engineering curriculum. And we just come to the conclusion when the pandemic hit that it was bigger than civil engineering, that it crossed all aspects of engineering. And that was actually up on my whiteboard was the sustainability engineering and the different themes across engineering that it might address, um, that's what I came back to. So the real focus on what I was doing before was looking at a modern curriculum for civil engineering, one that kind of focused on creativity and rounding out the engineering experience. Thank you, Jocelyn. And Emily, how about you? Well, you know, I actually had the unique experience of becoming a faculty member during the pandemic. So right before that, I was actually working in a staff role on uh, program planning and curriculum development and how to support faculty members as they create new courses and new curricula within their departments. So my work was specifically in the scholarship of teaching and learning, where I was using an entrepreneurial uh, planning framework that I had designed to support the design and development of post-secondary courses by examining the different stakeholders of learning outcomes. So that can be the students, that can be the faculty, that can also be the industry members that our students are going to eventually work for. So thinking about the different role that all of these stakeholders play in the creation of curricula, both at the course level and the program level, allows us to develop more creative and innovative programs the same way we would develop innovations within a business or entrepreneurial scenario. I was also working on enhancing creativity among our engineering students while still supporting their technical learning. We heard in the video that it's very important to support the socio-technical elements of an engineering program while also allowing the students to get the academic rigor that they need to be successful. So I was working on a framework that would then support the students as they developed those creativity and innovation skills alongside their technical learning. Great, and Mike. Thank you. Um, great to be here today. 
So I have many hats, as Jocelyn does as well, before the pandemic. Um, as in my role as a professor in the Schulich School of Engineering, in my research lab is looking at um, biomanufacturing of stem cells and scaling up production, basically looking at the link between um, what is discovered in, in the lab in a dish and how you get that to uh, lots and lots of people to actually um, affect their, their health and their care. Um, my other role as the Director of Biomedical Engineering in Calgary at the University um, and leading the, en the Engineering Solutions for Health research strategy was bringing together researchers from multiple different faculties um, including the Schulich School of Engineering, the Cummings School of Medicine, Kinesiology, Vet Med, Science and Nursing, among others, um, to really bring them together in teams to solve different problems in uh, mobility, imaging, uh, regenerative medicine, diagnostics, wearables and other novel technologies. Um, and as well as, as Jocelyn mentioned, the curriculum was something that we were interested in as well. And so we were working on bringing a new undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering to life. And I'm happy to report we have our first students right now that took a block week course a week ago and are now enrolled in their first classes in that program. Fantastic. This is really, really exciting stuff. But right in the middle of the term, COVID-19 uh, shutdown happened. And, brought, and this brought the need for rapid change and adaptation and a lot of innovation to thrive despite all the restrictions. So what I would like you to uh, briefly talk about is what were some of the immediate challenges you saw and some of the innovative solutions that you were able to come up with. And maybe this time we can start with Emily because she was trying to get everybody to be able to do their jobs with teaching. Yeah, so my role was to assist and train faculty to all of a sudden have to pivot into this online world. And it's really important to remember that there's a difference between emergency remote teaching and building an entire online course. Um, developing an entire course online takes a lot of prep. There's a lot of different tools involved. So we were bringing faculty members and students and teaching assistants up to speed very, very quickly. So the first, first step was really to get myself and my team to get familiar with the tools ourselves really quickly, then to create workshops that were going to engage and be effective. Uh, faculty members had a very short amount of time to pivot their courses and to find the most effective learning path was really important. Uh, like I said, in the middle of the pandemic, I then became a faculty member myself. And all of a sudden I went from the trainer to the trainee and I had to implement the same innovations that I had been teaching in my own classes. And one innovation that I really have been focusing on throughout the pandemic and beyond now has been the use of online interactive textbooks and how do we get students to engage with digital tools. Um, this also allowed me to then embed experiential learning in a virtual context while reaching students who have a variety of personal situations. I had students who were of course, taking classes remotely in a variety of countries and time zones. I even had a student who was taking his courses from um, some military barracks in a different country. Um, students with kids, students with you know, different demands in the home that now I was able to engage and support in a completely different way. So learning about those situations and brainstorming ways to pivot and those different temperaments and different um, you know, backgrounds of the students was something that provided a lot of material for being creative and innovative. And I really think the various digital tools, such as interactive textbooks, can be leveraged to support students and give them more of that practical experience while they're away from the in-person classroom. Thank you, Emily. And uh, Mike, how about you? So actually, Emily was super helpful in pivoting my class to online over the weekend. I was teaching a first year class with another instructor with 400 students, and we had to all of a sudden go to everything online, labs, tutorials, lectures. So thank you, Emily. <laughs> I learned a lot in those workshops. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the innovations we had to do right away was to figure out how to engage students and, and do that. Um, but the other innovation is really around research. And so we had, we didn't know it, but we had a, a fantastic foundation that had been built 
um, by these collaborative efforts across faculties that was really poised and ready to um, attack the problem of COVID-19. And so we had a number of linkages across um, across from engineering to medicine and kines and nursing and all sorts of other faculties. Um, and so we started to set up um, like biomedical engineering ask and offer sessions where, you know, what do you need? Who can we connect you with? Um, we had um, lots of individuals from Alberta Health Services contact us and we'd connect them to the right team. We had local industry, um, industry nationally across Canada. Um, do you have this expertise? What are you working on? Um, and we really found that those sessions helped every week to really connect people with us and with Innovate Calgary. Um, and one of the examples that, that came out of those is, is this ventilator project. And there's a number of different, there's probably three different ventilator projects. Um, but we were part of a team that really went from zero to producing hundreds of ventilators in a very short amount of time and collaborated with Alberta Health Services, collaborated with industry in Calgary and in Edmonton to build these and deliver them to, to Alberta Health Services. Um, and there've been another, a, a lot of other kind of technical innovations as well that have come out of these um, collaborations between, for example, someone who usually does drilling engineering and someone in medicine uh, to work on, on on projects related to the expertise around the engineering expertise from drilling, but applying it to other other areas. And so I think this ability to work across disciplines um, and work together as teams, which was really was there and poised ready to go, was really critical for the success of what a lot of the university did in response to COVID. Thank you, Mike and Jocelyn. Yeah, I agree. The pivot to online was the online teaching was one of the biggest challenges. But in addition to that, I'd say there's two things that really came up as, as immediate challenges. One is the way we communicate. And so there was a lot of communication required. There was a lot of nervousness and concerns about the changes and what the future might look like. And what I realized very quickly as a department head is when you're not in person, you're missing that informal communication chain where stuff just gets passed around. So you had to figure out different ways to communicate. And we figured out that we had to figure that out quite quickly, different platforms and different ways. And in some cases, these became very, very interesting. So in my own research, it meant that my students got involved in the Canada wide network and we had weekly discussions and, and science cafes about the ideas and so it broadened what our group, what our, our research group was about and who we interacted with. The second thing I had to pivot right away is we were in the middle of hiring people. And so that changed the idea of in-person interviews. And so I was on the other, other side of the desk of what Emily was dealing with. And we figured out really quickly some really innovative ways to use Zoom to how to interact with people and ways to make informal conversations happen in a way that we could hire top quality people. And we recruited some research superstars during this time period. And I, I have to say, I've now met everybody in person, um, which is phenomenal, but we figured out new ways of communicating and new ways of doing things that are just really interesting. And those were some of our biggest quick pivots in addition to the teaching. Thank you, Jocelyn. So as the pandemic moved forward and months turned into years, what happened to some of these innovations? And then maybe we'll start with Mike this time. And uh, so what happened to some of the projects you started? So I think I would, I would totally agree with Jocelyn about communication. So that's one thing that has definitely stayed with us. Our ability to connect across those faculties has been greatly enhanced because of these tools and the ability to reach out to industry and reach out to collaborators around the world um, has just exploded tenfold. So something that would take two months to schedule a meeting because you have to be in person is now you can do it in a, in a day or so and it's, it's accelerated things amazingly. Um, and so some of the other projects um, are, are collaborations that have resulted in, in new funding. So we had uh, millions of dollars in new funding that came about because of these teams that we put together and some of the calls from the government. Some of those teams have continued to uh, work on their, their research. Um, you might've seen something in the news about cough diagnosis with an app um, that came about because some of the collaborations that, that started, uh, you know, random things that we were connecting people together 
that uh, maybe didn't know that they needed each other. Um, and so I think we, we have looked to try to continue that energy to attack all sorts of other problems in the health system. And so we're looking to see how we can um, take that model of working with Alberta Health Services, working with all our researchers, no matter what faculty they're in, and working with um, industry to try to find, find, find solutions to problems. <laughs> we don't want to find more problems, <laughs> for sure. Thanks, Mike. And Emily, if you have a quick leak and say what, uh, what happened to the innovations that you are taking now that the classes are online. Well, I want to echo what Mike said about toolbox. You know, my, my course delivery toolbox, as it were, has really increased and become more flexible. So that last week I just delivered my first hybrid lecture where I had about 10 students in the classroom, 50 on Zoom, and getting the students to interact with each other across the different platforms, getting the you know customized learning experience for students, whether they needed that in-person interaction or they were in a situation where they needed to be online, it was really interesting to see them work with each other. Um, and that may change from week to week. One week I could have 50 in the classroom and 10 online. And to allow that adaptive learning, I think that this is really going to help us to improve the adaptive and customized experience for students. Um, the other thing as well is that I've now received research support to examine the benefits and how we increase and improve on those digital textbooks being used in the classroom. So I have a, a first year class right now that is taking part in a, a very elaborate digital textbook experience and I'm hoping to be able to study um, what's positive, what's negative about it, and how we can really harness that for, for future classes as well. Okay, and Jocelyn, I'm going to ask you a sort of a looking forward question and going forward and hoping that things will soon go back to pre-pandemic normal. What are the innovations that we will be taking forward and what are the lessons that we have learned? Yeah, thank you. Some of the really neat things that have come out of this pandemic are, I'm going to say mainly around our undergraduate curriculum and how we teach engineering. So if you remember back at the beginning, I said we wanted to have a modern curriculum, but we were looking at old ways of doing it. We this fall kind of completely blew up our civil engineering timetable and we're teaching hybrids of remote delivery and in studio. So what we're going to do moving forward, what we're doing this fall and we're going to do moving forward is instead of teaching engineering in our traditional lectures and labs, is we're doing um, design studio approach. So we're gonna have lectures that might be remote, they might be in a large lecture theater, and then we have more, that might be an hour, maybe two hours a week. And then we have significantly more time in a new design studio that we've built now on campus. And students sit in tables, groupings of four. We have a facilitator with the instructor, we have a, a teaching team around them. And we're using this built for purpose design studio to hands on solve engineering problems in a way that invokes creativity, that is more reflective of what we actually do out in the workforce and in industry when we're working in teams and we're working together to solve problems. So we are in the last stages of a new program in sustainable systems engineering, which is really exciting. Um, and that's a cross engineering platform. But in civil engineering, we're going to this changing the way we teach completely to this more of a design studio approach and having our interactions on campus to be really meaningful and really hands on. It's very exciting. And we're really looking forward to continuing this with our design, with our sustainability and with our digital engineering into the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Emily, Mike, do you want to add anything? Or should we move to the table discussion? I'll just add one little thing that we're going to we're going to be watching civil engineering closely as we build our biomedical engineering <laughs> program. So we built the second year and now we're going to build third and fourth year. We've got a plan, but I think it's very exciting what civil engineering is doing. And we have built a design spine in, in our program as well. And I think that we could probably learn from those things. And I, I think that the other thing that is that we're going to take forward is this ability to be nimble and to innovate quickly. And I think this the communication tools 
um, and the ability to pivot to new things is is really going to be exciting. And uh, I don't want it to go that to go back to pre-pandemic. I think I, I like this ability to be innovative and nimble, and I think that's what a lot of these new tools have have done for us. And so we're going to continue using them as we try to tackle problems with teams from throughout New Calgary, but also you know throughout Canada and the world, because now you can get those teams together so quickly and get the right people in the room to solve problems. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have now a very robust uh, collaboration with few professors in Brazil and the students have been working uh, very hard in lots of publications. We also want to, I also want to mention that we have also changed our common core first year engineering. And this also has uh, the same uh, format with lots more of the project base and the teamwork and communication skills that the students are learning as well as uh, electrical and software engineering. So lots of exciting things are happening. Um, but uh, I'm glad that we had some time, an opportunity to answer some questions from the group and thank you very much everyone. At this point, we'll go back to our virtual tables for a more interactive discussion and I'll invite you to share your thoughts on these innovations on the pandemic. Thank you. Hello everyone. As we wrap up, Sherry and I just want to thank you very much for participating and joining us this afternoon. We are apologetic for the technical difficulties, but we hope everybody's had a chance to enjoy the panel and the discussion. Even though we can't be together in person, it's great that we found a way. We're especially grateful to have your support and of course this opportunity to connect with you, especially during these challenging times. It's donors like you who have made possible the exciting innovations and advancements we've discussed this afternoon. Your legacy gifts ensure this important work will continue well into the future. And those, for those who are considering their legacy or their impact they might want to make. Sherry and I are here to help you guide or help guide you through the process. Remember, any gift, any size makes a difference. Thank you again for joining us and have a great evening and hopefully we'll see you in person next year. Thank you.